Upper Echelon is brought to you by Deloitte for innovative thinking and thorough strategic planning. Turn to Deloitte. We're joined by Johan van der Merwe. He's chief executive of Sunlum Investments. Johan, Sunlum Investments, uh, part of the broader Sunlum stable. Um, there are easily more than 40 business groups uh, or businesses across the Sunlum group. This is a company with an 81 billion rand market cap. Sunlum Investments, how does it fit within Sunlum? Yeah, it's really, as the, as the descriptor is, it's the investment part of Sunlum. Many times they will talk about the institutional part as well because we look after the institutional investments and also do the um, the distribution on the institutional side, whereas on the retail side, you know, we've got the bigger Sunlum, um, you know, sales force out there. But on the investment side, we basically look after all the policyholders, investors' money. Um, we also... Uh, by way of having to look after their money, we also put ourselves out there as an asset manager and an investment manager for other pension funds, corporates, uh, government, parastatals, uh, etc. So we really comprise all the investment-related activities of the Sunlam Group. And it will, uh, it will span the whole spectrum from asset management to multi-management to private clients to property uh, to hedge funds to um, private equity. So it's really across the whole board. And this is a business with a global footprint? That's a business with a global footprint. Because uh, firstly, for our clients in South Africa, we want to diversify offshore. You know, obviously with exchange control, that is limited. But, uh, you know, those exchange controls limitations have also been lifted. At one stage, we couldn't take any money offshore, then five, then ten. You know, at the moment, 20% on the institutional side, and in some cases on the retail side, up to 25% that we can invest offshore, and then we obviously want to make sure that we've got the capabilities on the international side to look after our, our South African clients, to really give them the holistic offering. Johan, uh, 14 businesses within the Sunlum Investments uh, grouping, do those businesses operate completely independently? How do, you, how do you get those businesses to collaborate and work together? That's a very good question, Hilton, because collaboration is really, for me, what it is about in, in really uh, giving us that competitive advantage. You know, we've set up the business uh, so that they compete uh, with specific businesses out there. You know, that's why we would have a private client business. There are other private client businesses out there. That's why we have a multi-manager. There are other multi-managers out there. But I will always say to them, the reason why we're part of the group should be a competitive advantage for us because otherwise we would have just uh, had loose you know companies or businesses all around so what we really try to do is leverage off one another you know on the one hand one can leverage on the cost side you can do things together but i'm not a i'm not a huge proponent of that but i want people to leverage off that and and if there are easy wins on the cost side that's it but it's really on the income side because that's where you have the blue sky understand why other businesses are so successful, what are they doing to wow their clients, learn from each other, and really collaborate on that basis to, to make it a better business at the end of the day. And no doubt there is some level of competition between the different businesses. Yeah, we obviously they, they, they do have their very specific segments and or competitive spaces that they play in. But, you know, the world is unfortunately not so black and white, you know, and, and there's definitely overlap in some cases. And, and, and you will find that in, in some areas, you know, uh, they do compete. But then we've got two horses in a race, you know, and then, you know, may the best horse win. But we don't try to go out and say, well, it is, it's all out competition. We try to really structure it in a way where we say, you know, different businesses look at different segments. Because we believe in the end of the day, that's what's best for the client. And our clients are actually, uh, um, you know, most important to us. We, we really see ourselves as a client-centric organization, and we do what is right for the client. Johan, is there a strong entrepreneurial culture within Sunlam? Yeah, there's, sometimes it's, uh, it's interesting that people talk about a big corporate and say, but there's an entrepreneurial culture. But you've said it earlier that, you know, there are more than 40 businesses in the Sunlam group, but there's 14 uh, in, in, in our cluster. And uh, if I may say so, I think we were really the first ones that started breaking up the big business into smaller units and say, you know, let me put a person there, a champion or a jockey, as I call them, in charge, uh, uh, make them responsible and keep them accountable at the end of the day. And more often than not, my belief is that they will surprise you on the upside. So yes, there is an entrepreneurial culture. Um, I've always, from day one, said that it's all about the people. So you've got to get the right people. I've also learned over time that in a big organization like Sunlam, 
it's not only about the people. You also have to have to have the right organizational design or the structure, because if if you don't give the people that structure and 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 the design to allow them and give them the freedom, you may attract them, but you will lose them eventually. So it's a it's a nice balance to get the right people and and to create a conducive environment where they can really show their talents and apply those talents and, uh, and and only be there to help them and to smooth things over for them, so to speak. Is it tough to find the right people uh, in the current market? It, it, no, not in the current market. You know, if, if I go back when I started at, at Sunland, unfortunately, we were a bit the laughing stock of the industry and things didn't go well. So, you know, to get your first person is also, but the second one, the third one, and where we now, Hilton, really, people really come and knock on our door and say, we want to work at Sunlum. I think we've become, to a very large extent, an employer of choice. I don't say the, the others that are not, but, but we are versus where we were before. And they say, we can see what's happening in this place. We can see uh, that people are happy. And, you know, you can put advertisements, you can go to universities, you can have days, etc. But it's the people inside the business who are your biggest ambassadors out there in terms of uh, whether it's a nice place to work. So at at the moment, with uh, with uh, you know the, the market's not all that uh, that great. You know it's tough, especially in Europe. We see a lot of South Africans coming back, uh, a lot of talent, skills, experience. So it's not it's not actually all that difficult to get uh, talent at this point in time. The important thing is is to get the talent, but to retain them as well. You spoke about those jockeys earlier. Uh, in terms of choosing those people, what qualities do you look for? Uh, common sense. You know, and, and people who can take other people along. Uh, if, one, if one looks at, 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 at intellect, I think in my business there are lots of people that are much more clever than, uh, than I am. Unfortunately, being clever is not a competitive advantage or a differentiating factor nowadays because everyone's clever. I mean, you get the youngsters that, that come into the business. They... I mean, they, uh, um, they're really clever. But you have to get the right person who can, who's got that, that other uh, uh, intelligence as well, not only the, the, the IQ, but the EQ and the social intelligence, etc. So you look for those people who can really take a team and lead them and, and make things happen at the end of the day. Johan, how do you help foster innovation um, across those 14 different businesses? You know, for me, innovation is is, is equal to uh, experimentation. You know, if you, if you have an experiment, it can either succeed or it can fail. Now, we also know in uh, in the corporate uh, environment, you know, failure is not uh, looked on, on very favorably. And, uh, you know, if you fail, corporate Siberia beckons. Um, and, and, and what we try to do is, is to um, support people and to say, but it's okay to make mistakes. Because if you punish people all the time when they make mistakes, don't think they're going to make less mistakes. They're just going to try less because they don't want to make a mistake. And, um, you know, I always compare it to, um, you know, when you, when you have, a, have a war. I mean, huge importance is paid to those missing in action and those wounded. And why is that? Because just imagine you missed in action or you're wounded and people just leave you. The morale will be down. And this is what I say about people who really try and they try hard and they fail, don't shoot them down because the morale will be down. People won't do it anymore. So I, I always say to, to, to my people, sometimes one should, uh, there should be a huge red flag for mediocre success, and sometimes one should actually uh, reward excellent failures. You know, if you make 10 mistakes in a row, it's a problem, but uh, you know, one, one should actually be more tolerant of mistakes in the business, and that actually, I think, creates a culture of innovation. And then I guess it's also about really rewarding your success and, and highlighting success. Yes, I, I, I think so. And uh, one, one, one's got to make and, – and if you get those, those killer products, you know, they really do well for the business. And then it's easy to actually reward people. We, we really much run a meritocracy as well. Uh, you know, you eat what you kill. And um, so, so I think that is well entrenched in the business too. Johan, uh, technology across the group obviously helping drive this innovation um, and, and drive this experimentation. How is technology run uh, within your cluster and across the Sunlam group? Is this, is this really a, 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 fun a function of head office saying these are the systems, this is what you work with, or, or is there a more flexible approach? No, it's definitely a more flexible approach, and I can tell you now, Hilton, if I, 
If I have to sit back and I say, you know, what, what are one of the shortcomings of most CEOs in the, you know, let's call it in the business environment? It is IT. In, if I don't have an IT person that I don't trust uh, or that I do trust, th then I have a problem. And, and, and I rely so much on them because systems are so important, the back office, you know, the functionality, um, you know, for, for customers to interact with you, et cetera. And it's very difficult to sometimes, you know, they come with these huge budgets to say no to it because uh, you say no to it and something goes wrong and, and, and that's a problem. So you, the, the, I've got a very close relationship with my IT people. When I joined Salam as well, that was one of the first people that I handpicked from outside, brought that person in, and, and from then, you know, kept a very good relationship uh, on that side. To try and understand, you know, I'm, I haven't got an IT background, etc. cetera. I tr try to apply a bit of common sense there, but it's, uh, you know, and it's huge budgets. After people, IT is our biggest budget in the business. Johan, you uh, spent 10 years at Sunlam, uh, before that, five years at Investec Asset Management, and before that, six years um, at GenCore, working in corporate finance, uh, and that's the precursor to what we know today as BHP Bulletin. Right. Is there anything that stands out from your time at GenCore that perhaps you've, you've applied and you are applying today? Yeah, I think I've, I've learned uh, from, from then that there's no substitute for hard work. And that if you put in the hours and you put in the the sweat that that, that you will, you know, all other things being equal, you, you, you should actually win. My time at Jenko was was a fantastic and my the high point there was really the uh, the deal that we did uh, by by buying Bulletin from from the Royal Dutch Shell Group where I was uh, uh, one of a, a team of four people working on that uh, transaction for about eighteen months. And no doubt lots of flights. Yeah, lots of flights. I've seen the world. It was before I got married and had kids, etc. So it was fantastic. If I had to do it today, it, would be, it wouldn't be so attractive, I suppose. Johan, just looking at the Salam Investments Group, uh, I suppose we can't have this discussion without talking about Africa. The opportunities in Africa are plentiful um, as the market matures. How important is it to work with local partners, though, the people that understand each of these regions? I've been to West Africa, and it, it seems a very easy on paper um, to enter a market, but in practice, much more difficult. Yeah. Now, Hilton, uh, I, I see uh, Africa as the sleeping giant. Um, and from where it's now and where I believe it's going to be in 10 or 15 years' time is two very different places. Um, it is Sunlam's philosophy and also our practice to only go into countries where we partner with locals. Um, we see that as, as imperative. Um, we've seen people going into countries without partners and they burn their fingers. Uh, it's important, it doesn't matter whether you think you know this, the, the lay of the land and how things actually operate in the country, you need local partners over there. So we, we definitely, um, spend quite a bit of time finding the right partner because obviously it's also important to get the right partner, but then we partner with them and, and you know, then hopefully it's a fruitful relationship for, for both of us. And it's so far it's worked very, very well for us doing it in that way. I would imagine, though, that each of these 14 businesses um, would, would either enter a country or, or start working on entering a country independently. Yeah, what we've uh, actually done, th that was the case before, Hilton. What we've done, uh, you know, a few years ago is to say that if one does go into a country, you know, there are not that many partners um, and, 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 you know, not only do we have investment-related businesses, we also have short-term insurance or general insurance in Santam. We've got the life business um, and, and they do different types of things as well. So what we've done, you know, a couple of years ago is to actually consolidate all our domestic businesses, whether it's in Africa or other emerging markets, under a banner called Salam Emerging Markets. Now, Salam Emerging Markets is, is run by Heine Vert, but he will then call on us as the investment cluster if he starts an asset manager to bring the skill set to the table, etc. What we run from the investment cluster are, for instance, the Pan-Africa funds, whether it's enlisted equity or property or private equity or the debt side, that would sit full inside because it's not a domestic business in a country, it's a pan-Africa uh, and, 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 and that's where you need those investment skills. And then what we do, because we're all already in 12 African countries, we leverage all of those uh, kind of, uh, businesses that we have because I think, f you know, there are very few companies, in, in, if any, that's got the same footprint as we have uh, across Africa.
Johanna, aside from Africa, where are the opportunities for growth for Salam Investments? You know, we believe that one should get involved where you have a competitive adva advantage. Um, we don't, we find it very difficult to compete with the Europeans on European soil. We also find it difficult to compete with the Americans on American soil. Um, but then that people tell us, but you know, the Americans and the Europeans are also in Africa and in India. I said, no, no, that's fine. I feel comfortable to compete with the Americans and the Europeans on Indian soil because I think I have a competitive advantage. Because of the um, diversity in South Africa, because of the way that we have to operate here, um, you know, I think we've got a, a competitive advantage in the emerging markets, and that's really where our focus then, then will be. That doesn't mean we won't have any businesses in the developed markets because we also have to diversify for our client bases uh, in South Africa, in Africa, uh, in other emerging markets into the developed world. But in the developed world, by and large, we will have what we call a product factory. So we will have an investment team generating investment performance in a certain uh, area of the world, but we won't try to, to, to get distribution, don't try to get necessarily clients out of Australia or out of Hong Kong, et cetera, for a domestic business. We just have a business there because we invest in that region. So that's a differential that we try to uh, put in there. Johan, it's been a pleasure talking with you. Johan van der is Chief Executive of Sunlam Investments. Thank you. And Upper Echelon was brought to you by Deloitte for innovative thinking and thorough strategic planning. Turn to Deloitte.